The food service, hospitality, and retail industries are evolving in ways you've never heard of until now. Hosted by global industry tech innovator Rob Grimes and powered by the IFBTA, Tech Bytes is your go to podcast, putting technology innovation and trends on the menu. Rob Grimes on the Tech Bytes podcast, sponsored by and put together by the IFBTA. And today it's really an honor for me to have a very young old friend, Richard Del Valle, who is the CIO of Bojangles. So welcome. Hey, Rob, it's good to see you. Appreciate the time today. Well, you know, we get to see each other, what, maybe two, three times a year at different industry events, but we used to spend a lot more time together, but we don't really get the chance at these industry events to have a conversation on different things. Yeah, it's unfortunate because you're running around checking out all the new stuff and going to sessions. Yeah, so it's fun to be able to just sit back and chat a little bit. Well, you know, one thing I was thinking about is not exactly how long we've known each other, but the fact that I believe our backgrounds are actually very similar um, in that um, we both really started in restaurant management or hotel management, working in operations and somehow found our way into IT. Yeah, it's exactly the same. It's, uh, you know, being around the industry in the early days of touchscreen POS and making that trip over from ops to IT and never really looking, always looking a little sideways, but never back per se. Um, well, I don't know. I, I don't know if we can actually say that because I think maybe you have gone backwards a couple of times because it occurs to me that you started in operations, headed over into IT, went back into operations, and now you're back in IT. Yeah, I've managed to move. Actually, it's a good point because I have managed to move back and forth a few times, um, you know, primarily IT for about 10 years, brought back over into an ops role for a number of years, uh, kind of stayed on the ops side um, for pure ops side for quite some time. And then, um, you know, when this Bojangles opportunity came around to kind of go into a more pure, though not entirely pure IT position again, uh, it was kind of exciting and fun for me. Uh, but I, I came know, back. Are there really any operations. pure IT positions anymore? Because it really seems like in technology, it's really driven now by operations. It used to be driven by finance, you know, I guess because of cost control and everything. And one would look at POS and things that way. But now if you're going to drive the business forward, you know, it appears it's an operational role. And then you're not the IT is sort of lagging behind the operational request today, where in the past you were trying to find a home for some of the IT that was going, you know, because people were just coming up with ideas left and right. Yeah, you were pulling instead of pushing. I think what, what's happened over the last yeah, probably 15, 10, 15 years is IT has become strategic, whereas before it was more of a commodity type of thing, right? And and I think that, and I think where, where people with our background like yours and mine can really kind of have a bit of a leg up is that we understand how the products are used. Uh, you know, in the restaurants themselves. You mean and eating the food? You. Is that you eating and, and me eating too? Oh, okay. Um, but, you know, the reality of it is, is that when you really know how the end user is going to need something to work, you can refine the development early on in the process. And I think it does make a big difference. And I think you're seeing more, more people in senior roles in IT on the restaurant side now with that operational bend. If you took that back 15, 20 years ago, you probably saw what I would call more techies, you know, and, and less restaurants. More techies or finance, yeah, or which finance is always people. the debate, you know, is yeah. it uh, is it technical, is it finance? But we're also starting to see people who have an IT background and an operational background going to, you know, top leadership as a COO, which you've done, and also, you know, as a CEO of some of the companies. Yeah, and it does make a big difference. I mean, knowing how to leverage and deploy technology in this day and age is critical. I mean, it's just absolutely critical. And, you know, we're we're excited because we've been able to do a lot here in the last couple of years. Um, and going out to something like FS Tech really brings home to us a lot of the progress we've been able to make. And, you know, a 40-year-old company um, really kind of getting out there with some right. really cool stuff, you know? Well, you know, that's something that sort of impressed me because... Uh, Bojangles itself, and, and we're not really here to talk about Bojangles as much as your experience in IT in the industry, but I think might uh, find some people might be surprised at some of the advances that you guys have done. You've gotten certainly a lot of press on doing AI voice, uh, you know, drive throughs. Yeah. And, you know, while that's 
something that's been talked about a lot in the last couple of years. You seem to really have embraced that and are moving forward on that. Another one would be uh, kiosk uh, ordering, which I thought was going away, but seems to have come back. And, and I saw something in the last couple of days on that one. So, you know, it seems like you guys are actually embracing a bunch of technology that's out there. Yeah. And it's funny, you know, a lot of these things sort of, they, they, they germinate from a, a concern perspective, right? Am I going to be able to find employees? Am I going to be able to find employees at a reasonable rate of pay, right? Out West is getting quite out of control. Um, but they shift very quickly because one of the most important things for a restaurant is consistency, right? And, and I think no matter where you sit in the spectrum of, of quality, Consistency is highly valued by guests. And what I'm finding with a lot of these technology tools is it's enabling a level of consistency that we wouldn't have otherwise, right? Instant greetings at the drive through right? I mean, no, no, no longer do you pull up to a Bojangles drive through with AI and wonder whether somebody's going to answer quickly, right? And um, so I think what's, what we're discovering is the tech is great from a tech, but it does save you money. But there's this, there's this benefit of getting a more consistent guest experience that I think people are starting to see and starting to embrace kind of moves things to a whole nother level at that point in time. Well, you know, it's sort of interesting that, so the first bullet point that you gave us was really about labor, which most people seem to associate technology and the fear of technology having to do with labor. So am I going to be replaced by robotics? You know, am I going to, uh, you know, do I have enough labor to go ahead and staff, you know, which, which you've mentioned, but it seems like the consumer embraces technology and has gotten comfortable with it, that it's okay to layer it in and possibly give better service in there. And the thought that comes to mind, and if we stick with the drive through for a moment, you know, I can think about 15 years ago, I think it was when people like Carl's and some other people uh, did, um, uh, you know, voice over IP drive through to remote call centers. Boy, did they get a lot of you know, flack about that because it, and by the way, the reason wasn't necessarily labor save. I never looked at it as labor savings. I actually, I'm with you. I sort of looked at it as more consistency of service because somebody who was trained to actually take orders like that could fulfill an order quicker, which people want speed of service, but also could round out an order just because you increase the check average doesn't mean that it's bad. It means you actually might be adding things to the menu that they really want. Mm hmm no, and I think you know, and it's funny. I remember that that period of time where where that was getting hot. I think the other thing that I, I think you have to be careful with tech, and we in particular here at Bojangles have to be super careful because we are a high touch brand. You know, we're a Southern brand. You know, we're, we're we're chicken biscuits and tea, every you know, handmade food. But there's a warmth to the brand. So as we layer in this tech, we're super careful to make sure that we compensate for maybe a little bit of a loss of personality there. By, by going a little over the top where we do interact, right? And and there's a bit of an art to that, training people to say, hey, look, drive-through person, you know, you're not taking orders, fulfilling orders, and cashing orders out anymore. You're only doing two of those three things, which is still not easy. Take that little bit of extra time and use it with the guests, right? When they get to the window, engage a little bit more. And, you know, we've been very, we've been successful, right? With the hundred and some odd that we have up and running, friendliness scores stay the same or improve. So well, it's the, kind of a funny dynamic yeah, when you look at it, you know, um, how that works. Well, if you, so you brought up something. So I, you know what? I, I think a lot of people are also concerned that you're going to take a company's culture out okay. with the tech. Now, you've just said that, you know, you're a Southern company, Southern hospitality is what people would certainly associate with it, that personal touch. Now, today you're using a hybrid approach because if you're doing the drive through and you're taking the orders using you know, computer assisted uh, voice AI, but then they come to the window. People always remember that last touch. Right. And for you today, that last touch is actually a person. Right. A person who's more relaxed than they were before and able to be more engaging than they were why, before. Why are we're they getting more a relaxed? similar benefit. Yeah. And we're getting a similar be benefit on the kiosk side as well. Um, because we're, we're sort of taking that work that we're taking away not necessarily removing a person, but empowering that person to do a better job, you know, to spend a little bit more time to, to make it more personal, uh, not to be so wrapped up in the task that they forget about the service. It, it's, it's a really cool dynamic. If you can marry those two things together, and, and I'm saying it's easy because it has not been easy. It's my right. one year overnight success story, right? But 
you know, if you get it right and you engage your teams properly, there's ways to kind of get this technology in a way that, that, that actually improves everybody. It helps the employee, helps the guest, helps the bottom line, the trifecta of tech, you know, um, and, uh, you know, and frankly, yeah, we're, we're, we're excited about it, but it has worked because we've engaged our people. They're not fighting against it. They're embracing it and running with it. And I think, but do you that's, think that that's because the culture of the people or the generations that are taking the jobs today are intuitively comfortable with technology where even five years ago, they may not have been, you know, it's interesting. I, I would have thought that at first, but there was still, you know, when you look at the initial restaurants we went into with Belinda, which is what we call, um, which is what we call our AI tool, which by the way, was named by restaurant employees. That was the first step in embracing it, right? We said, hey, we've got this cool thing here. We want to call it Bo something because we call everything Bo something here. It's kind of fun. Um, but restaurant team, you tell me what it, what what this thing's name is. And after a spirit debate and some very frightening name suggestions, we found Bo Linda. Are you sure they didn't put that in the chat GPT and just say, the, come up No, with no, some no. Names? I was watching closely. Uh, but the... Uh, but at the end of the day, what was fun about that is, but those people, the first group was worried, saying, hey, is this going to take my job? Is it going to take that job? But within days, they quickly realized, no, this is not an enemy. This is my friend, right? And, uh, <clears throat> and you know, frankly, nobody's lost a job because of kiosks or because of AI at Bojangles. Do you think people are going to take jobs because you're employing better technology than the competitors? I believe that to be true. And I think, you know, if you look at our restaurant staffing, we're back up in the high 90s again. Uh, you know, we're, we, it's a little early to sort of gauge turnover, but the early indicators are that that's dropping as well. It's a better work environment. People don't leave as quickly. We, you know, we save money on training, improve the overall experience. Um, it really, I think some of these restaurant tech projects, if done correctly, can make a difference to your overall brand. In fact, we rebranded the IT department here. We call ourselves Bowtech. Because the only tech we're interested in is tech that helps Bojangles be better. Um, so we, we've, we kind of draw a fine line. You know, we don't put in stuff because it's cool. It's, we've got to be able to see it improving the brand. Well, also, uh, you know, if you employ technology in the right places, it allows you to grow and to do some non-traditional non-traditional or traditionally thought of, you know, food service operations, but yet still keep now, it's interesting. Keep that culture in place, but perhaps that culture is actually being generated and kept consistent by, by you know, uh, technology. Yeah, it, it's true. It's enabling, right, instead of, instead of impeding. And, uh, and it, it does, it, you know, it, it does make a difference. And we, we often say if you go into a Belinda restaurant and you gathered the team together and said, we're going to take it out tomorrow, you, you would not get out of there in a very good state of being because they would fight you tooth and nail. And that's how much it's become part of who they are. You know, I'm an opening manager now. I know I've got at least one employee showing up at open. You know, she's she's a, she's a computer, but she's showing up. And hey, uh, at some point she might be showing up even when the hours are closed. Well, she's able to tell you, I'm sorry, we're not here right now. Please come back at seven, you know? so Right, but what happens when you go ahead and you put, what happens when they perfect, you know, uh, uh, chicken vending machines? that cook it up fresh, but serve it 24 hours a day. And I've seen the pizza version of that. I haven't seen the chicken one. Um, there is. There's a burger version, a hot dog version, a pizza version. And I think we're, and I saw the salad bar and I know that chicken is out there. Now, one of the questions I have is whether you could employ a cooking technology like sous vide to perhaps do, you know, uh, uh, fried chicken, you know, or to do, you know, those types of things and have it the same. And I think that's where we're headed. Well, I'm honored bound to point out that with our high touch um, professional marinades and, and, and high quality people, I doubt there's a machine out there that can duplicate us. However, with my low bar for pizza, I'm sure the pizza machine would be perfectly fine for me. You have low bar um, for pizza. <laughs> no, come on. You know, there's, 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 uh, I've seen a lot of different machines and some of them are actually making that's not frozen pizzas that they're vending but they're actually partially baked but they have the toppings they have the regular dough and it's made originally some of those machines started to help independent pizza owners to be able to take a day off i mean it's brilliant it's, I mean, if you think I, about it that, that's life enhancing i mean you know and you, you have seen a lot of this technology come i know you spend time out and um Time out west, you know, these are the things that generally move their way, you know, from 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 Asia to, 
you know, to, to the U.S. It seems to be where, where a lot of that vending technology comes from. It's an interesting thought. I mean, one of the things we're excited about around kiosk is uh, we have a couple of different kiosk partners, but one of them is Grubber. And, uh, you know, it leverages the Olo platform, which means it doesn't need to physically be in your restaurant, right? So if I'm, if I'm a food service concessionaire in a, in a university, I can have kiosks in all the dorms, right? And they can order there and it pushes into- Okay, pushes so into I got to gotta put you on the spot. Yeah. So who actually thought of that partnership? Did you guys think of that? Did Grubber think of that? You know, did Olo think about it? How did that actually come about? Yeah, it's interesting. I'm not sure. It wasn't our idea. I mean, I'd like to say it was, but it wasn't. Um, we we knew that we needed a POS agnostic version of, of kiosk. Um, Olo had a preferred partner at the time. We started working with them. You know, with some cultural differences, wasn't the right fit for us. Um, we started looking at other options, and that's when we found Grubber, which we've been very pleased with. Um, we also use Xenial's native kiosk, which is very good. Um, but because I have a mixed bag of POS systems, I needed to have two solutions, right? Right. Um, and the Olo enabled ones. On well, paper. the online ordering, though, online ordering ought to be able to integrate with multiple POS solutions down at the store level. Well, it does. But if you think about how you set up online ordering, right, think, think about th there's, there's basically there's a conflict there. And I didn't discover it until we started testing it, which is when, I, when, I, when I'm working with an online ordering package, that I want a guest to access from their phone, for instance. I want that relatively simple. I don't want to give them every variation option on earth. I don't want to slow down their transaction speed. So I set that up in a very simplistic way. Now I try to pick that up and put it on a kiosk. And we very rapidly discovered that psychologically, when a guest walks through the door of a restaurant, they immediately expect to have that full range of options they would have if they were talking to a cashier, right? So we found very quickly, it wasn't as simple as it looked, we had to then go back in and we couldn't just skin Olo onto that onto that kiosk. We started having to adapt and add things to it. The standard things our guests ask for, you know, like we get a lot of requests for um, um, unseasoned potato, uh, French fries. We, we have a very, very right. lively seasoning on our fries um, and it's they're fantastic. But some people just don't want that much you know, spice. It was an option we didn't have in Olo. We had to add, we had to customize an Olo interface for the kiosk. So I would caution people, yes, it looks easier. It's, and it is a little easier, but it's not, it's not the slam dunk throw a light switch thing. That well, we listen, uh, let's just take a quick break and then we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll talk about a few other things, you know, really tacking on top of, you know, what you just brought up and we'll just come back in a minute. And let's talk about operationally and some of the ideas and things that are out there. With the rapid expansion of technology in the food and beverage industries, finding the right supplier can become overwhelming and complicated. To simplify this process, the IFBTA created Exchange. Exchange is a powerful search tool where users can easily narrow down their technology search and refine results by application type, geography served, department, and more. Browse resources and learn more about the industry's technology suppliers at exchange.ifbta.org. Now, back to the show. So welcome back. And I'm uh, with Richard Del Valle, who is with uh, Bojangles as their CIO and a longtime friend. And uh, we're just having one of those conversations. And, and right before the Right before we took a break, we were sort of talking about the nuances uh, of the different ways of entry that you may not think. And one thing I'd point out to you is, you know, sometimes the obvious stares us in the face at, or technology doesn't have to cost a lot. And we were talking about your integration with uh, Olo and Grubber and getting into the different POSs and things like that. And it reminds me of a conversation I had in the last couple of weeks with a hotel person where they made the transition in the room of picking up the phone to call for room service. And somebody came up with this brilliant idea. Why don't we just put one of the online ordering things up on the TV? Because we can go ahead and, you know, take the orders anyway with our POS. And it go. sounds like, it sounds like you're discovering the same thing that you're seeing some obvious technologies that can work together, not necessarily developing, you know, custom stuff, but are there some, are there some tech peeves that you might have out there? You just wish our, in yeah, we know that we know that Bojangles is doing it all. Okay. Under your leadership, but are there some tech peeves you have out there that you just wish, 
you know, people would come about and, and do? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, Rob, because, you know, I, I, I come from primarily a full service background. This is, this is my first trip into, um, we don't call it fast food at Bojangles. That's not the right word for it, but drive through enabled restaurants, we'll call it. Right. And, uh, you know, I've learned a lot. Sorry. Belinda's. Belinda's, Belinda's. And I've learned a lot since I got here because, you know, that speed and reliability of that drive through transaction is kind of the lifeblood of our business, even though we still do about 30% dining room, which is amazing. Um, but mostly we're drive through And, you know, one of the things that drives me nuts, and I think one of my competitors has sorted this out fairly well, is payment, right? So we've now figured out how to automate the order taking and speed that up, right? We're very good at, at getting the food bundled and ready to go. No problem there. But the tender piece is still archaic, right? It's still happening. I drive up to the window. I take out my credit card. In our case, we're, we're you know, near field. We're putting a device out on a stick, to, you know, very sophisticated stick, but a stick nonetheless for you to, to pay yeah. with. Um, one of my things is there's got to be a way between that drive through um, order taking point and the window to get that payment, right? And, and I do know that some, some of our competitors that have a robust app where you load your payment method into the app, you're able to sort of use that interface. Um, but I have to believe there's something better between the window and the order point to get that tender out of the way. Because now our drive through person is really only doing one thing, and that's, you know, being fulfilling that order and being engaging. Uh, that's one that I, that I wish somebody would, would really sort out. Well, you need that anyway, because if you take a look at some of some of the people that are doing multi-lane drive-through or in other countries, as you already pointed out, where they're able to deliver food in multi-lanes or pickup places, if you eliminate that bottleneck of the payment, you know, then yeah. you are not dependent upon the single location that you have to go to. You can spread it out and do faster service and more service. Right. You get readers about, like I was on a panel with, um, with a New Zealand-based operator at FS Tech, great guy, also using Bolinda. Um, but because in New Zealand, Apple Pay and Samsung Pay are so prevalent, right? The near field is what they need. And they're able to duplicate that, those near field detectors at the drive through um, order point, right? So they've solved that problem. You know, I think the problem in the U.S. is that we're still primarily credit cards, right? We barely worked our way up to tap. And, and I think so for us, we're always going to be a little bit behind, I think, the rest of Europe and, and, and the rest of the world on things like that. But you're absolutely right. That's the key, right? If I can, then I can have some readers strategically placed, get that tender transaction done before I do anything. And I guess then the other piece is order ahead in a more efficient way. You know, like you can use all to order ahead today, but you really, you have those built-in windows or delays that come out of an online ordering system into POS. Um, you know, I know Starbucks has gotten themselves in a world of trouble by speeding that up to the point where they've overwhelmed their restaurants. So it's somewhere in between. Um, but yeah, those are things that I think the guest is going to expect more convenience, more options, you know, a, a more so, seamless experience. Well, you know what? So this is where the brainstorming sort of comes in, right? So you're saying this and I'm sitting here thinking about it. And in my head, I'm, I'm doing, what are the analogies or what are the other places where people need faster service where there used to be bottlenecks? And there's a couple things that come to mind. One is airports, Right. <laughs> Oh my gosh, you know, trying to go through. Now, here's the problem. You get products like Clear out there that are supposed to get faster, but now everybody has Clear, so the TSA pre-line is sometimes slower, is faster than the Clear, and now the airlines all have their own things like the Delta does in Atlanta. Okay, so then I think about what did Clear do? Well, Clear sat there and said, let's speed up your car rental. Oh, wait a minute, concert tickets. Let's go ahead and take care of that. Now, some of this was motivated by COVID where they had to do passes. So they didn't want to, okay. But they started to think outside their clear box and, you know, other ways of doing it. So I'm instantly thinking here of um, drive through. I don't know the answer to this, but I wonder what percentage of people have an so, uh, easy pass or something like that already on their car. I don't know. Don't know. But probably I know I lot. see it almost probably everywhere. Yeah, probably a lot. Yeah, probably a lot. And by the way, if they don't, you go through some of these highways and what they do, they take a picture of your license plate and you get built, right, in certain states. So they've accomplished it two ways. How come we're not just uh, applying that if it's already on the car or the license plate technology to read it, not to necessarily identify, but send the bill? You know, why don't you just solve that problem with something common? It's like saying that everybody's got a cell phone. 
So, yep. you know, pretty much. So that's a common way of doing something, right? But, you know, some of the camera technology that you're seeing is some of the the, uh, the drive through timers that are based on cameras now, right, have that have that capacity. Everybody has this dream of tying that to loyalty and saying, hey, Rob, do you want that double cheeseburger you had the other day? Again, hey, did you know right? there's a double cheeseburger day, by the way, coming up? Well, there should be. It, no, I was in a Wegmans enough. yesterday. It says double cheeseburger day. I mean, not hamburger day, double cheeseburger day. Double I mean, cheeseburger what day. That? What's well, that? Every okay. it seems like it seems like every every month there's a national coffee day. Um, so I think they're just making it up at this point in time. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, anyway. I've, I've got visions of the of the of the uh, the the Munchie Pass or whatever you want to call it. You know, it's near field type of reader. Whatever it is, whoever solves that one is going to be a superstar because I think it's a problem everybody has, and um, and I think it's an interesting way to leverage the tech. But again, I think also having those new you know, instead of the magnetic loop-based drive-through timers and systems, you know, these camera-based systems start to open up a bunch of possibilities that we didn't have before, right? Even with even with Belinda in place, a camera-based tech would be helpful for me because if you can look back through the line and see, hey, I've got a 10 stack. Well, to do stack, the analysis, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you can sit there and go, okay, you know, I'm going to stop trying to upsell now. I'm just going to try and move some of these cars forward. Right. Then I'm going to go back to upselling. Because the thing about tech is, as, as you and I both know, and everybody listening probably knows, it, it, it's not sensitive. It doesn't know. It's going to do the same thing every time until we tell it to do something different. Right? right. It's not going to go. It's not going to go. Hey, Rob sounds like he's in a bit of a rush. I'm not going to bother him with trying to sell him a cookie. Right. Right. But I, I sort of see that as where you layer on the things like AI on top of it. So let me give you an example. I, I talked to somebody recently, and they're talking about the consistency of making pizzas. Right. right. And so I said, well, how are you doing that? So, well, we're using a camera to watch people make the pizza, but also make sure that they put the pepperoni, the right number of pepperoni in the right placement because they got a brand standard for that, right? right? So it's sort of the same thing here. And I said, so how are you doing that? Are you like putting cameras? And they said, no, the cameras are already there. We're using the surveillance cameras that are already there, which by the way, are pointed out at the drive-through. They're pointed out at you know the cooking area. And so all they're doing is they're using the feed that already exists, but they're layering on the analytical software to be able to watch and make some recommendations based upon it. Yeah, which is smart, right? So you've got, yeah, what you already have, what can I do with it? Um, you're seeing a little bit of that now. It's probably early days on some of that. Um, but again, those technologies are really interesting. I mean, when, you know, assuming that that you can layer an AI factor on top of it, there's not a human being trying to figure out what's really going on there and signaling you back. Yeah, I think that's kind of a next wave for us. I think, you know, as I look forward into 2025, I definitely want to start testing some of the camera based versions as opposed to the closed. Yeah, device. use the systems that are already there, because as you've already pointed out, the feed is already there. Yep. I mean, it's yep. already there. It's probably placed everywhere you would want it to be. So yeah. so your your feed is already there. And so why not just take advantage of something you already have and just do the analysis another set of eyes. Maybe that's an maybe that's another yeah. way. And get something proactive out of a system that really is there to be reactive, right? You um, know, you know, there's one thing uh that I don't know a lot of people appreciate this about the chicken business. Uh, but you brought up pizza before and and that you're a pizza aficionado, so we got that one. But you know, I find that pizza and chicken are some of the hardest types of foods for systems to really work with. And that's why we see systems that are specifically built for pizza or the pizza guys make their own. And pe and chicken, people don't understand that if you really want it to be fresh and hot, which they really expect here, that there's actually a cooking time. And even though I know they're working on shortening the cooking time, for sure, we're not quite there yet, and yet you have to be prepared in advance, or you're going to have a line like all the way, I don't know what. And there are some complexities there. Was that a learning experience for you since this was, A, your first time, I guess, in in the uh, uh, quicker service environment and also with chicken? Yeah, actually, it was it was it was a huge learning curve, right? I mean, fried chicken from the moment I go, oops, I need more fried chicken to the moment I have it to serve is about 18 minutes, right? Give or take for somebody really good at it. All right. And and so for us, it's almost like just in time inventory, right? For us, the criticality is, OK, I need to have every bit of food that I'm going to need ready. I don't want it ready for too long because quality is important for right. us, right? We're, we're very tight on our hold times here at Bojangles. 
very tight for quality. Um, so, you know, we took systems that you and I were using 20 years ago, like food and labor management systems, and have now expanded those into true production systems. So we're able to tell our managers, hey, if this forecast is what's really happening today, which most of the time it is, you know, at 12 o'clock, you should have, you know, 10 breasts, you know, 20 thighs, 30 legs, whatever, right? Plus all the other things that we serve. And so we've kind of taken what used to be, you know, a system designed to take inventory, calculate food costs and give you a suggested order and turned it into an actual day, you know, through the day, just in time device, right? To tell you what you need. Because in this business, you're absolutely critical. If you run out of something, it, the entire thing falls apart. Um, but at the same time, you know, quality is really critical, right? So you, so you just want barely enough to get you through this. It is a fine time. balance between the two. Because, right. you know, when people are looking at expense, they might try to, and that's a problem sometimes in the franchise environment, you know, they might try to extend, you know, the length of holding time right. that's there, you know, and you need to reduce waste you know, length of holding time. And that is a brand standard and that is your reputation there. But at the same time, you know, you need it to be ready to serve, you know, when they need to have it. So you accurately have to forecast. Yeah, well, it's really been exciting. If you look at the, the um, so we're using, um, and it's another thing we just introduced this year, we call it Bow Food and Bow Labor. It's an Altametrics product from our old, ten, our old friend, Matesh. Um, really, high quality sales forecasting engine. That's the thing that blows my mind. It's an AI driven sales forecast engine. And and I'll tell you, on average, that thing is within one and a half or two percent of what we're actually but doing. But it can be updated uh, real time because you're also monitoring, you know, service flow, the drive through, you know, if you have 70% coming through, you actually can see if you're ahead of schedule, if it is all integrated. In which it is. <clears throat> so it's all talking. So everything is talking to each other. We're still doing a little bit of work on what we call Smarter Kitchen, which is a more real time version of it. Right. But even even the one you run first thing in the morning and set yourself up for the day is extraordinarily good. And uh, and it really has improved our food quality. It's reduced our waste, which is which is great. Um we got the usual benefits we'd want out of a food product, right? Like the suggested order has basically eliminated borrowing food. You know, our managers aren't out running from restaurant to restaurant to borrow chicken anymore. It leaves them in the store, you know, taking care of the guests. And uh, between that and the prep and the prep and the uh, and the cooking, what we call bin management guides, right, really has made a difference to us. I mean, really has. And uh, you know, and then you tack labor onto that, which is using the same, you know, AI driven sales forecast, and is putting what I call the right people in the right place at the right time. You know, not too much, not too little, just right all the time. Um, really ch has changed the dynamic of how we run the restaurants in a very, Do very positive way. Do you see yourself uh, moving towards more robotics in the kitchen to make the chicken and to, you know, to schedule there? Not not for labor reasons, but consistency and space and, you know, things yeah, like that. The, you know, the product development is in there. I mean, you you have what they, I mean, I'm probably, it's probably a trade name, but what I think of as sippy which is your automatic yeah. beverage dispenser, right? right? Um, that that technology is pretty buttoned up. That's sophisticated. That's trustworthy. Doesn't help us per se, but a very big, as I said early on, we're chicken, biscuits, and tea, right? The tea part's the important part. We're about 70% plus mix on, on sweet would tea. Would that be sweet tea? That would be sweet tea, yeah, which I've, which again, I've grown to, to love to a dangerous point. Um, yeah. And... Uh, and they're not all created equally. Move to the south, you very quickly realize there's sweet tea and there's sweet tea and there's our sweet tea. And uh, so, so even something like sippy wouldn't help us because the tea is coming out of a separate dispenser, obviously fresh. Um, there are the automated burger flipping devices and things. We don't we don't cook burgers, so you're really down to the fryolator based dispensers around. And there are for that. We, you know, we hand bread our chicken, so that precludes that. So I I think for us. That's probably downstream pretty far. I think for a lot of brands, there's real possibility there. Um, for us, I think it's a little of it, it, it's it's out of reach at the moment, or it doesn't exist basically. So if you looked, I mean, you just came came back from you know FS Tech. You're thinking about things for the next year or so, and you are out in the industry, and you're talking to franchisees, and you're talking to customers. So what do you think the uh, next twelve to eighteen months? 
is going to be the big story. I think, you know, AI is just going to be embedded. So that, that conversation mm-hmm. will start to go, it'll be there, but it'll just be embedded. But what do you think the next 12 to 18 months are going to bring for tech? Well, I think for other for brands, I think it's still going to be, have, I think, I think everybody and their brother is trying to solve the conundrum of AI at the drive-thru. And I, and I think, and I think people will continue to struggle. It's a lot harder than it appears requires a lot of work but i think that'll continue to be a lead story but over does the next that imply thing. that you got it right uh i'd like to say we got it more right than most perfect i you know there's room for well, perfection. It's not going away but it may become more personable and may start to reflect your culture yeah and i think that's the key and just but just even getting a successful test out is a tremendous amount of work because I explain to people, you know, you and I grew up in the world of enter a message, right? Somebody asks for something weird. We open up a screen on the POS terminal. We type in the weird thing, right? Can't do that with AI. Can't do that. AI needs a PLU for everything. So whatever the weird thing of the day is, we've got to put a button in for it. And a lot of brands don't realize that you better be ready for about six months worth of work. (coughs) Excuse me. Because... That has nothing to do before you even get in front of a guest to make sure that you've captured all this, the normal, uh, unusual requests. Wouldn't you just let it run for six months, just recording all the transactions and listening? Well, it records. So you have a list. Yeah, you have a listening mode, but you have to take that listening and then translate it into, okay, here's what I would not have been able to ring up if I didn't do X, X, and Y. And what's really funny is, is you go from region to region, that changes. Of course. As well, right? Um, so, so anyway, so I think, you know, looking glass, I think you're going to keep hearing a lot about drive through AI. I think kiosk is back. I think the West coast going to these, you know, people talk about $20 an hour. You and I both know that's what we you thought pay the for. kiosk was dead. And then, you know, Until, COVID hits and the kiosk isn't dead. Yeah. Governor. Yeah. California must have some interest in boosting kiosk use because I think that's really reawakened the kiosk. Um, you know, that the other West coast, states will follow suit. But, you know, people talk about $20 an hour, and then you try to explain to somebody, it's not $20 an hour. Everybody gets $20 an hour now. If you want somebody good, it's $24, $25, $26 (laughs) an hour, right? So, you know, kiosk is back. Kiosk is is here to stay. I agree with that. Um, I think for us, it's AI-driven reporting, exception reporting. That's sort of a a really, again, back to AI, true, but real opportunity to kind of get out of the data overload that we give our operators and really get into some high. Well, there's so much data and that's really what it is. It's analytics and it's data analytics. So, you know, that's why I say the AI term, you know, actionable insights, you know, actionable information, you know, people are coming up with different terms, but really it's the use of it, uh, you know, that's out there. So, you know, that's a interesting observation, you know, to just sort of see how that's going to fit. Take it a step further. I don't like it. Like I laughed at some of the companies who are trying to use AI for menu development and kept coming out with the same burger. You know, things, I think there's things it's not going to get good at right away. I think it'll continue to be the buzz. Um, but I do think it has some uses. Certainly the drive through we've proven. Um, call well, anything with anything with voice and response, for sure, yeah. because it has a yeah. bigger database to draw from. Yeah, because I mean, you think about telephone, you know, most restaurants are not very good at answering the phone. I don't care what brand it is. Um, and, and uh, you know, so those those kind of tools there can be super useful, right? Um, in minimizing the calls that actually get to a, to, a, to a store manager to the point where it is now manageable and they can answer the right. phone. Um, so again, I see a lot of that out there. Uh, automation, I think, continues to be a slow burn. Like we'll get better levels of automation for cooking equipment. It's just going to take longer than I think people thought. Um, yeah, I think those are those are the biggies. And I think there's a lot of companies that are behind the curve on certainly on, on drive through AI or using AI in general for order taking. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of noise around that over the next year. I'm grateful to be where we are. We are lucky we have a great partner, technology partner, High Auto. Um, the software is very, very good. Uh, I have an excellent team. I mean, you've known me for a long time, you know, I'm nothing without a team. And, uh, and I've got a great one here that I inherited, believe it or not. I came here and, and you know, and found well, that's a, right. an incredible group of people, you know, um, challenged them and they, they ran at the challenges. So it's, uh, it, it'll be an interesting, but I, I think we're not, we've not heard the last AI. I think and we're not replacing you anytime soon with AI, right? Uh, you no, know, I don't believe a robot version of me would, would be, I would mail one to you. Um, so you can keep it at home at all times. <laughs> well, I'm not so sure that 
I'm not so sure we need to do that. Well, listen, <laughs> Richard, it's, it's been a pleasure, you know, uh, having a, conver- a longer conversation than we've had in years. I know, um, I know, but of right. course, we're sharing it with everybody uh, that's here. But I really appreciate the insight here and uh, and having you on Tech Bytes, you know, and supporting the IFBTA. Of course, we got to get that Charlotte uh, chapter back up, which we, we were do. doing we right do. before COVID. So uh, thank you for joining us and sharing the perspective in the ops to IT to ops to CIO seat that you now hold at Bojangles. Uh, pleasure as always, Rob. It's nice to catch up. It's been a long time we've been doing this, and it's uh, nice, nice, nice to be able to catch up like this. Well, listen, thank you very much, uh, Rob Grimes for the IFPTA. And here's the one thing I learned today: if Richard doesn't know it, Bo knows it. <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by the International Food and Beverage Technology Association. The IFBTA is the industry's voice of food service, hospitality, and retail technology, providing thought leadership as your single impartial and go-to resource. The IFBTA offers in-person and online communities to connect with your peers, the exchange an all-encompassing global technology resource, and an industry-wide professional education and certification program. The bottom line is the IFBTA is your place to gather, learn, and share and share in conversations like the one we're having today. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Tech Bytes, powered by the IFBTA. I'm Rob Grimes, your host, and I look forward to taking our next bite of technology together.